House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren, and co-hosting today from the East, from the Boston, smoky Boston area, <laughs> and that's not because of the fires, um, but we've got Marty. No, you don't like Marty. that one? Yeah, no. I thought, I was trying to shorten, uh, David I think Rose, Rose is better. Rose, yeah, David Rose Martino. <laughs> Uh, in Boston, that's because he, he, you know, he kills the ladies and leaves a right. rose on their bed. Um, <laughs> no, not really. Um, so, don't tell yeah. my wife. <laughs> well, no, she doesn't listen. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you don't let her listen. She doesn't love to listen. <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, uh, enough of that goofy stuff. You know. I was like, so now uh, today uh, we've got uh, uh, all important guest exclusive from. Creative Edge, uh, of course, Big Mickey. You're so fine, Mickey. Um, so today we are running. He's he's just like I don't even know what to call him, but he's got books. He's got he's done some acting. He's done some, you name it. Uh, you know, fitness. He does it all. So, Mr. Ace Antonio Hall, thank you for being here. That must have been one of the most eloquent introductions I've ever had. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you haven't been introduced very much, then. <laughs> I'll tell you, because, you know, I'm not really that guy, right? I barely can speak. I don't even know why they've got me here. God, you know, I, I said I hardly walk and talk, and I'm colorblind, and, geez. Um, wow. So um, you have got quite a, a career going on, like quite a, you kind of, do it all in a sense. Um, who who is Ace Hall? Like, what? Who are you then? And w why have you had such a wild life? Sort of. Wow, that's a great question. You know, uh, I'm a creative, and I think I, you know, just through osmosis, through DNA, got that from, you know, genetically from my father, uh, who uh, was an artist, a, a painter, a poet. He wrote this, some jazz, some uh, classic jazz song, So What, by Miles Davis. And I just walked off the stage. And I think just being around him, uh, it just kind of spelled out, you know, that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And uh, as a creative, I just wanted, you know, you, you can't help it. You, uh, you wake up with just things in your mind that just has to be done. And uh, so I delved in a lot of different things until I found my niche, I guess you could say. What, what, so did you find, like, so what do you consider your niche? Is that the writing? Absolutely. I, I consider myself a wannabe in all, the other, in, in all the other categories. I've always, even when I taught school for 13 years, uh, it was kind of like a fluke. I was a, one of the best teachers, and when I say that, I mean I was awarded, you know, as uh, one of the best teachers in the district in New York, and I was also awarded as, director of a few different programs, but I never felt like I, I fit in, you know, as a, in music, I never felt like I fit in, you know, it was kind of a fluke a little bit, the, the experiences I've had, um, uh, acting, same thing, but writing was the one thing, and it took me about 11 years to get it right, but writing is the one thing that I feel like I fit in, that, that I was made to do, I'm a storyteller. Well, but, okay, so what do you, what did you find, it's, you say it takes 11 years, so in your particular case, You've got the creative side. That, that's, yes. that's there. So yeah. what was the 11-year development or challenge for you? Whew, listen, so I went to school at uh, Long Island University, the CW Post Campus, and I studied screenwriting and, uh, and I guess, production and directing. Uh, you know, uh, that's what I majored in. And I never wrote a daggone script in my life, a full script in my life. You know, I, I went straight from graduating into the studio. And so in 2008 was when I decided to quit my nearly my near six-figure job as an associate producer at the Silver, associate uh, uh, director of education at the Silver Learning Center in Northridge, California, to pursue and learn how to write. Now, I thought I could write. I taught English for uh, a decade, and I thought I could write, you know, and I had background in screenwriting, but writing a novel is 
a whole different level. Um, and so it took me that long to get to, as one of my, my buddies, uh, David Gerald said, it takes about a million words and you still, you're still practicing. So it took me about that long to kind of really up, figure out how to write, you know, to a degree where my peers in the literary industry uh, saw me as you know. I always I always think of Avatar, like when when she said in the, in the first Avatar, the Avatar that's only come out. I see you. It took me eleven years before they could really see me, and that just took a lot of studying and classes and workshops and writing and reading. Of course, I read hundreds of books in the eleven years, um, fifty in the first year of writing, and so mm. that's what that's what I mean. And it, it took me that long to kind of figure out that I actually had a little bit of a magic, a little bit of magic as a storyteller and as a, as a novelist. Yeah. Okay. So but when you actually go to try and publish a book, um, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of rejection. It's kind of scary. <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of feelings and emotion that come with that, but yeah. there must've been something that uh, lit that fire. There must've been a catalyst that, made you brave enough because that takes a lot of courage to actually mm -hmm. put your work out that you're doing comes from you it's personal you put this work out and 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 anybody can say anything uh, people can reject you people can say oh that's garbage or you know it's such a uh, uh, social media world yeah so was there something or someone that kind of got you that's to do a, that that's alan that's a great question and the best way i can answer that is through I want you to visualize you going into a bakery and tasting the best you know pie or best cake you've ever had in your entire life that baker was probably meant to do that that baker or you know whatever it may be uh, a six-year-old that writes a, a, a uh, symphony that lasts through the ages you know and his name is Ludwig it, it's in me. I wake up and it's, you know, not to sound schizophrenic, but I wake up and the, the characters speak to me. Uh, the stories speak to me. I, you know, I, I, I'm sitting anywhere. I'm waiting in line at the grocery store and I have these ideas and, and, and I, they have to come out on paper. And it's the only time uh, of any of the things that I've ever done where it doesn't stop. I wake up four or five o'clock in the morning, you know, I have to write because there's something inside of me pushing me. So they're either, e either in a past life, if you believe that kind of thing, I was a writer or something, but that's what really drove me. The rejections, I think, came from a life of being persistent and learning how to be disciplined. I was disciplined in a lot of things, but you know, I wasn't a rock singer. I tried rock for a while, and, you know, nothing ever came of that. You say social media, heck, I got, you know, I would put videos out and get maybe three people viewed it, you know. But it was once I started writing that I started really seeing that, okay, I have something here. Um, when I started writing short stories, the three of my short stories back in 2017, I started writing in 2016 short stories. Three of my short stories were on the reading list at the Horror Writers Association to be a Bram Stoke, for a Bram Stoke, you know, to be a, to be recognized or, or to be a, what do you call it? Uh, the reading list comes right before it's uh, nominated, to be nominated. So I was on the reading list along with Stephen King for my short stories. And that's when I knew, okay, you got something going here. You got some magic. You got to keep pressing on. You got to polish this up. You got to learn what you need to learn and make it happen. Well, speaking of short stories, um, yep. and you've written short stories and novels, do you prefer writing um, uh, short fiction, or do you like the longer form better? Do you feel you're more of a natural short storyteller or a natural no novelist? I'm a novelist. I, I, you know, I have too much to say to put in a short story. Short story was a great discipline. It taught me how to get what you need to say done quickly. Uh, but I, I, I just love the whole world of, of writing novels and, and, and building building worlds. I just love that so much. That's You know, uh, you said when you were in the supermarket or wherever, you sort of get these ideas and your characters speak to you. So what, you just write it on the back of the lady in front of you? Sure. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> <I mean>? no. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I, I'm just curious yeah. to get a felt out and start writing it all over her, her blouse. Uh, no, but, <laughs> but when I, they they come to you, actually, this is important. Yeah. Um, these these characters speak to you, say, so you hear voices. Yeah. Um, you're you're like Dave. You see, Dave yes. gets we keep him locked up in the basement because the basement he hears person. voices, right? Well, you don't want to let him loose. No, he, he's not a person you want to meet. Um, <laughs> so, so, but when you hear these voices, how do you know um, what to do with them? Like, how do you know who they are, or where they come from, and stuff? That you, you know, I think part of it comes from well, the voices come from characters that I've developed in my stories, so. Uh, I can go over and over and over again of a certain scene. And once I write the scene down, and the scene may not work or it is working, I hear the characters, I hear the, 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 the dialogue in my head. And sometimes I hear the characters do, you know, uh, play out the dialogue, and I'm like, oh, that's not right. But sometimes it's a, a revelation, like, oh, that's why that character did this, because, you know, she likes ice cream, whatever it is. I'm just saying for an example. And, yeah, I've written more. I've, I've been in Hooters and uh, eating wings and writing them on on uh, napkins. I've written them on my hand, yes, on the back of shirts. Wherever I can write them, you know, I write it. <laughs> There's not a lot of skirt in that place, but um, <laughs> yes, as I can imagine what you're writing them on. But no, that's what I do. Yeah, but do you, do you feel personally attached to your characters then? Like, do you, do you feel like, you know, a lot of writers, we interview tons, you know, hundreds a year. Um, so... In fiction, they have these, you know, this creative process. So, do you feel like they're your family or your friends, or do you like how do you, your kids? Like, where, where, where do you stand with your your characters? For one, I feel like they're not family because I try to put them through as much turmoil as I can possibly put them through. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> it, it, well, and maybe I, you know, did that earlier to my brother, but if it's not family, um, I, you know, I, and, and as far as being attached, yes, I, I do feel a certain attachment to him, but I've learned also that I have so many characters. I always start off with the main characters and I have to just kill them off or get rid of them or convert them into one. So, uh, yeah, I guess I am a little attached to them, but not to the point where, you know, they control me. And that's what I'm saying now, but. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering, um, you know, I've had a character once that um, was in one novel and then just, like, showed up in another novel and just, just said, I'm here and you're going you're gonna to write me into this novel. I was just wondering, have you had any character, any, any of your characters ever done anything that maybe surprised you? While you yes, writing? yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, one of my characters that I'm writing now, uh, I started out as, you know, I wanted that character to be benevolent and just a really good character, and I realized that that character was a killer. That surprised uh -huh. me. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Now, 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 your characters, you're not hearing voices, and you're going out and killing people or anything. Or anything. <laughs> I just want to make sure, right? I mean, it's like, you know. Um, yeah, but when you, you also say, saw medication here. Yeah, yeah, we have the, <laughs> the drive through here is open. <laughs> But, no, but I wonder when you say you killed them off. So you know, it's funny. One of the uh, J. D. Horn is a is a big writer, and when we had him here, he said he would take characters and kill them off that were people that he had met that were really rude. Oh, that's you know, funny. maybe in a shopping line or <laughs> cut them off and stuff. He so he would take that person and write them in, and they would be the one that would have a terrible death. So I found that that'd be really interesting. So of course I didn't cut them off, or I wouldn't. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so it, is, do you get characters from people you've met? Y yes, but I don't really. I don't uh, punish. I don't find a person that I've met and want to punish them as a character. I don't do that. Um, but no, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, yeah. you know, I, I growing up. Do you remember, uh, you know, I come from the era where, you know, our cartoons were, uh, I just want to say classy. I'm not saying that the cartoons today aren't. You know, I love The Simpsons and stuff like that. But, you know, we had the Bugs Bunny that played classical music. And mm -hmm. all of those cartoons uh, from Fred Flintstone, the Flintstones, you know, they came, they were the honeymooners, you know. You right. could kind of attach those, those, those cartoons to something uh, identifiable 
Uh, even the way Deathstroke is the same thing as, uh, what's that guy? Wade Wilson is the same thing as Slade Wilson, you know, DC and Marvel. And I think from being exposed to so many stories, being exposed to so many films, TV, and people in real life, you can't help but take certain personalities and put them into a character, you know? So, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a melting pot of all the different experiences that I've had visually. And all you know, and and just through experiences. Well, how, how do you keep track of your storylines and your characters? Do you have any uh, uh, process or any tools or anything like that that you use uh, to keep track of multiple characters and storylines? Man, I'm all over the place. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I I I have, you know, I have certain templates that I write in, and I you know. Uh, now that I, you know, on my iPhone, there's like notes that I can write and I keep, I try to keep folders of, 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 of characters or, or, or certain, um, like their powers or powers or abilities or character traits. Um, but I have like 10,000 of them and it's just, it's just gets overwhelming. You try to go through it a little bit. Um, yeah, so I'm all over the place, but I think part of it of just writing it down helps keep, keep me a little structured. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, when you, I have, I, 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 there's so many different ideas and all over the place and you, you have to have something to try to keep it organized. So I, I use my notepad. I wonder what's going to happen if you ever get Alzheimer's and you're older and you have all these characters. You want to tell who's real and who's not. <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying. I, I just, you know, you know but be careful, you know. Yeah. Tell Marty to leave me alone. Yo. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's time, time for dinner, Blanche. Um, well, that's interesting. So now, you know, you're, you're big, your award winner at the uh, Bram Stroker Award is... Bram, Bram Stoker. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. I, I, was, I was at the Stroker Awards, and I thought I... I was going to get us in trouble. I thought for sure you were there. But I, I guess I made a mistake. I, sorry, but for the... Uh, for, for the different you were at the, strokes for different folks, all right? Well, you know, the, the Stroker Awards is a lot of fun, I'll tell you. Yeah, but, but they get, you get a free bag with towels. In it, you know, but you know, so you're two, 2019 Bram Stoker Awards. Okay, so um, so you did a book and, and you you won that. I guess it was the uh, uh, an award for um, young uh, kind of science fiction, kind of that sort of story. Um, what what where did that novel come from for you? And that's uh, that's called the Worry Mosaic. Um, that's it. Yeah. And so how did that come to you? You're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe it. So I've always wanted to write a story like Quincy Medical Examiner. Do you, do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, series? yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, a medical procedure. I just always wanted to write a story like that. And maybe after watching... Uh, the Hound of Baskerville, the old one, the original one, uh, about the fourth time an idea came to me. Now, the two don't even collide. I mean, the two don't correspond. But somehow or another, <laughs> wanting to write a medical procedural and a detective story at the same time, a Warren Mosaic was born. I don't believe it. <laughs> me neither there has to be something you're not telling us the truth that's all right i understand you know people like the artists like to keep secrets and we understand you know it's, it's it goes all over uh yeah yeah but you know do, were you expecting that kind of response were you expecting the um the award and 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 what what happened around this book or were you just sort of was it a complete surprise you know uh Taoism says, I'm not Dao, I'm not Dao, but Taoism says, do your work and let go, you know, and I kind of, I, I, I did the best that I could for that, and I was working on another project, another novel, I had no idea it would be that well received, yes, of course, you, you write a book and you want it to, to do well, and you want it, you know, your peers to like it, and uh, to be recognized, I had no idea that it would get the response that it got. So it was, it was a wonderful surprise. 
Ah, but then do you feel pressure to, yeah. you know, do something much the same again? Does that kind of yeah. feel, make you feel like... Oh, yes, yes. I knew you were going to ask that. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes. And, and, and it makes it, you know, um, the book that's coming out in September is called Lipstick Asylum. Uh, which is really a reimagining of my first novel, which was called The Confessions of Silver Slasher. Um, it's a reimagining of that. Uh, I retired Silver Slasher and now I have this new character named Cozy Coleman. And, uh, she's a kick butt zombie slasher. But, you know, I, I just, I just had, no idea that it was going to get that kind of response. And, and, and now I sit down and I write and it's, you, you know, I'm, I'm just a lot more, what's the word? Pedantic. I'm a lot more pedantic with everything. I go over each chapter over cause you know, you want it to be the same, but I realize that, you know, uh, artists are known. A lot of artists are known for one special thing. Most artists probably are known for one special thing. When I say artists, I mean like musicians and actors, you know, and, and as well as authors are known for one thing. And it's, so it's very, it's very hard to duplicate that, you know, that, that success in, in, in their, in their, in their, you know, in their path. But so I realized that, but you still try to do it. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of pressure. And the book that I'm writing now is taking about two years. And I have over a hundred thousand words and I'm still cleaning and chopping this stuff off and polishing it up. So yeah, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, but does it change it does it change your focus in writing? <clears throat> like when you look back and you've kind of completed a lot of it, do you think that because you were in the back of your mind you have this thought about, okay, after an award and doing a follow up, does it make you rethink your writing a lot? No, it, it, it just makes me want to be better. You know, if you like that, wait till my next book. It's going to be even better, you know, and, 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 and I'm trying to just make it, you know, there, I, you know, I guess every artist, if, if you've known anyone who, who's a creative and they let you see or hear something that they've done that hasn't reached the public yet, but they've done it a while ago. You know, they always say, "Yeah, hey, you know, that's 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 oh, that's old. That's you know, here's some good stuff here, you know." And you're like, "Hey, it hasn't even reached the public yet. This is some great stuff, man. Yeah, that's okay." You know, we're always trying to be better, and you know, so my next book, I'm pretty sure will be the narrative. The, the, the narrative will be stronger. The characterization will be stronger. The plot will be stronger. You know, I'm gonna make sure there aren't any plot holes. All the different things that I thought I kind of got wrong in the book that won the award. <laughs> You know, I'm going to try to, to 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 make it better in the next book. Well, with um, you you just talking about um, how artists are known sometimes for one thing, and in that same vein, I was just wondering. Um, you know, I have some friends who have kind of lamented that. They've been labeled zombie writers or vampire writers. And yeah, some have found peace with it. Do you ever worry about being, I guess, like typecast as a zombie author or anything like that? Um. Hmm. Not really, because uh, I, mean, I mean, maybe, but I'm not really worried about it because I have. Well, for one, uh, my father created. Uh, I'm, I'm reintroducing a character that my father created in 1963. Wow. Um, it was published, and it was the first black superhero that came out in 1963, three years before Black wow. Panther, which was '66. And wow. so, thank you, thank you. And so I'm delving into a whole new world of superheroes. So I still want to attach the horror, the horror and sci-fi spin to it. But, you know, uh, you know, who knows what will happen from that? And it's still in the same multiverse of all these different characters I'm creating. So who knows? You know, um, we'll see. That's all I can say is we'll see. But I don't think that I will be typecast into a zombie writer. But we'll see. Hmm. And and a war mosaic has nothing to do with zombies. Okay. I was going to say a, a war mosaic is probably like your Vogue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like a virgin, I don't know. Inside um, joke. Inside joke. Inside joke yeah. Um, 
<laughs> but now, and you I, know, it, and I still get roses to this very day. Yeah, every <laughs> every year. It's been thirty years. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> yeah, fresh roses once a year. I tell you, it's not no, not many people can say that. Um, but in the in the stories, like Oweri, um is there a subtext? Is there? Do you do you put some sort of, you know, someone takes home the book and reads it, and of course they get the main theme, the story, they read about the characters, all that sort of stuff, the surface stuff. Is there a subtext or is there something you want that reader to take home besides that? You know, I think I think uh, all writers have like a little subtext, whether they admit it or not, you know, what they really are writing the story for. And uh, uh, sometimes I think the key is to almost keep it hidden, you know, under layers, you know. Uh, so either you're not too preachy or you're not too intellectual or you're not too cheesy, whatever it is. And uh, so the subtext, part of the subtext there uh, has to do with uh, just the way uh, I believe the government or governments from different worlds are always uh, going to be, you know, are always going to be the oppressor. That's part of it. And then the other part of it is I just believe that one day, we're going to be able to capitalize or be able to figure out how to to use our consciousness or how to tap into our consciousness a lot more than we're doing now. Hey, if, if Bezos can send, you know, people up in space, you know, I think, you know, I think scientifically and technologically, uh, we're moving really, really fast towards understanding how the conscious mind works. And, and figuring out and, and making certain type of electronics and tools and computer uh, uh, and computers that can can tap into the brain and our neural mm -hmm. implant and, and you know like carbon like 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 well, ultra carbon you know you know with neural implants is, they, they have stuff like that now so the subtext mm -hmm. is really about you know opening up a whole new world of how we can tap into our consciousness now yes. you go by that name for you two of the books, O'Reary and Lipstick. Um, and on some of the other books, you're under Ace Antonio Hall. So me being a, a Canadian here, uh, maybe explain where that, where that comes from and what Inzondi is. Yeah, so part of, okay, so in 2017, in 2007, first of all, my full name is, before I go into that, what happened in 2017, my full name is Asi Mandisi, which is A-C-E is the first three letters, which is really supposed to be pronounced Ase. Asi Mandisi Inzandi Hall. That's my real name. Uh, my middle name is Inzandi. And Asi Mandisi was a, a king of Kush, Africa, who laid down the stellar systems for the first calendar. Uh, King Asiman DC. And so, you know, growing up, I think, uh, it was about ninth grade. So everyone, growing up, everyone called me Zandi and in, or in Zandi growing up by my middle name, Zandi. Everyone called me that. I mean, my, my friends called me Zombie. Maybe that's where I got the whole <laughs> protection of the zombies from, you know, Zombie, you know, when they were kidding around. And in ninth grade, I went to, I switched schools and went to a school called Paxson Junior High School in Jacksonville, Florida. And I said, you know what? I want to be cool now. My name is Ace. You know, and that's when I became <laughs> Ace <laughs> in ninth grade. I wasn't cool at all. I was pointy and a nerd, but, you know, couldn't tell me that then. So that's when I became Ace. So in 2017, a friend of mine told me that one of my father's first publishers was looking to contact me. And he had no way to contact him. I said, well, do you have his number? He said, no. So I, I, I don't know. I just, I looked it up on the Internet, and there it was very easily. You know, I found it very easily. And I called him. Now, you, Alan, you're not going to believe this again. You know. <laughs> I don't believe it. I, I'm going to call. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, called, I called the guy up, and he answered the phone. Who is this? And I told him who I was. And, you know, he was a friend of my father's. 
and he was one of the, the people who published, was one of the first publishers of my father. And he said, my father used to call me Man DC, as opposed to Ashy Man DC, to call me Man DC. And this man said, Man DC, I was just now sitting here looking at my phone, wondering how I could get in contact with you, and you called me. That's when I knew, okay, so this conversation was meant to be. It had to be, you know. And so he told me, hey, Black Panther just made a billion dollars and it's doing so well, I think now's the perfect time to reintroduce your dad's character into the world. And so we talked for a long time. He gave me some names of some publishers that I could contact, and I did. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't like what they had to say. But um, hmm. so I, it, it began a whole new path of me becoming more Afrocentric and attaching myself to, you know, my, you know who I really am. No, no longer ace, which was a facade. You know, I, I'm not ace anyway. It's not ace, but really becoming who I, you know, I grew up no, being being called in Zandi, and 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 attaching myself to my cultural roots in Zandi. And you know what? I really believe there's a strength in names. And Dad, going mm-hmm. as soon as I chose in Zandi, that book won the Brown Stoker. So, not saying that was all that was to it, but you know. Mm-hmm. I don't believe uh, it. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. It came full circle. Yeah, it's not. Hey, actually, what, what, what's it like But when you take a character that your dad created, first of all, um, and you bring that person, that character, back to life? Um, it, it, isn't that kind of a really hard thing to, to take on because... You, you know, you, you are not him. You are you are a part of your father, but you are a different person, a different soul. So that means you'll have different intentions, maybe. Yeah. You'll have different. You, so does, does this sort of get in the way, or how how do you deal with that? It, 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 you don't know the half of how hard it is. First of all, my father didn't give me much to work on. Uh, you know, the character has no secret identity. You know, so it, it, it's just trying to, you know, the character was like, you know, uh, who's like, I'm trying to think of a character, I guess, no, because even Wonder Woman has a secret identity. I can't, I can't think of any characters right now who you see them as they are, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to be able to use these characters, to use this, use the character and put them in the world that I wanted to put them in, you know, he had no real, he, had, he didn't have a strong backstory. So I'm developing the backstory while still trying to be, to pay homage to my father's, you know, original character. Uh, so it, it, it's very difficult. And that's part of why it's taking so long to get where I'm going now. And dad, I hope you like it, you know, rest in peace. But, uh, you know, we're going to see what happens. And, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very difficult because, you know, like I said, Dad didn't give give me much to work on, work with. Well, maybe have have him identify as a woman, or have a, him being really a woman identifying as a superhero man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can see why I don't write. Did you hear the cricket? <laughs> yeah. Well, you can see why I don't Radio write. Radio listeners, did you hear? <laughs> well, they know. They know. I, I don't write fiction, and, and, you know, that's that's sort of, this is why. <laughs> uh, well, it was a try. You know, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to help you out, give you ideas, get you up there. Actually, actually, that's a great idea, and I love the way we're in the times, we're in the era now where the original comic book character looks different now. I mean... Uh, Captain America, uh, I believe, uh, you know, was a woman and, uh, uh, in the comic books. Uh, same thing with Thor, uh, Black Panther. Uh, so I love that, you know, we're getting to an age where we can uh, change genders, change races, you know, and, and just have this very diverse collective uh, mentality that heroes look like you look like me look like anyone so i love that so that's you know i mean just the other day i was watching loki and there was a alligator loki so you know i love it i love it <laughs> well i i don't think i'd be a superhero that's you know 
bald old. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> super shine. Um, wow. Um, so where do you where do you see yourself going? Where do you see yourself in ten years? Oh, see now that's a see that's a tricky question. That's the kind it of is. question. That's the kind of question when your when your wife asks you, "Am I getting fat?" Mm-hmm. So you know. <laughs> Yeah, do these pants make my ass look fat? No. Uh, yeah, you got to watch out your answer to that because one can sound too confident and too cocky and the other can sound uh, not, you know, uh, too shy. Um, I, okay. I, well, I was, without I was, a conclusion I was, then, maybe maybe what, what, are you, what are you looking to go towards? So without a conclusion and saying, oh, I'm going to be this – What's your kind of goal, or what kind of what are you looking to accomplish in the next ten years? How's that? How about if I tell you what I would love? Okay. I don't know where, I, you know, but this is what I would love. I would love to be at a place ten years from now where I have a company that that has its footings in every part of the entertainment industry. I would love that. I would love for video games, for virtual reality games, for board games, films, anime, animation, novels, and I even have some ideas for radio uh, with, uh, with writing. I would love to have a company that has, you know, an um, that that has branches that touches all of those different is music that touches all of those different entities. I would love that. Uh, will it happen? I don't know. I know that I'm focused on writing uh, a ton of novels, uh, but it would be great. I can tell you this: I always wanted to do a comic book, and after talking to my buddy Russell Nolte uh, a couple of weeks ago. I don't ever. I I don't want to do a comic book. Yeah, you can adapt it to comic books, but it's just like being a a lawyer and a doctor. It's a whole new profession. I don't want to learn how to you know do comic books. If you want to adapt it, great. So that kind of took the taste out of my mouth. But it would be wonderful to have a company that has branches that touches on all the entities of of entertainment. In ten years, I think that could be. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think that's something that I could believe could happen in ten years. Well, I think didn't Harvey Weinstein have that? But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm not going there. anyway. <laughs> I, I, I look more towards the Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I asked you this. Um, you know, writing is a sedentary profession. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy, I do martial arts and, and some fitness myself. Um, and, uh, what, what, what form? What form? Well, well I do also uh, the Taekwondo, uh, uh, Jeet Kune Do. Um, you do Jeet Kune Do too? I've done Jeet Kune Do and Kali, uh, Jeet Kune Do concepts. And, yeah, I've done a lot of, a lot of that, uh, lot of that stuff. And, um, well, I, I, you know, I'm trying to get rid of my gut. <laughs> and, uh, so even though I like fitness, you know, it, it's, some of it's not working. So, you know, and I know you wrote a book called uh, Lord of the Flies, Fitness for Writers. And, yeah. um, and you know, Lord of the Flies being, I, I believe, dumbbell flies. Uh, do you have any advice for writers or anybody who's sedentary in, in a profession in keeping fit during uh, long stretches behind the keyboard? <laughs> I have a lot of advice, uh, but there, you know, I, I know that writers are probably not going to take it. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. But I think the key really is, for me, it's all about mental acuity. So if you want to keep sharp, and, you know, um, I'm on tons of caffeine and coffee all day long, <laughs> and so I know how easy it is to be kind of groggy. It's not, I, I can't write when I'm groggy. I, I, you know, I just, the ideas aren't, aren't sharp. They aren't there. So to, to add with the, the caffeine and to add to, to sharpen your mental acuity, I think you should be active. And active can be just doing something for 10 minutes every single day, you know, uh, walking around the block, you know, um, you know, while you're sitting there, you know, with a five pound weight, you know, you kind of just, you take, you know, take every time you stand up after an hour or so to kind of stretch out a little bit, you know, you work out with the 10-pound weights, you know, 
whatever it may be. I just feel like you should do that at least 10 to 15 minutes every single day, seven days a week. And I think that it will definitely help your writing. So if you want to help your writing, I think you should be, you should, you should uh, develop a discipline for being active. Absolutely. Yeah. And stop eating fast food too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just, that's, yeah. Just saying, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, now, how do you how do you want people to find you? Um, like, do you have a website or a street address or like what? <laughs> what <laughs> how do you want people to? to yeah, well, you know, whatever you want. Like, I mean, you might want them coming by your house, and or or, or do you want them to go to a website or a, a Facebook? Or like, what's what's your best? Communicate sense of communicating with with you know I, I I'm on usually uh, three sites regularly. Uh, one is for older people, one is for younger people, and one is for I don't know what these people are. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one is Facebook. Uh, it's just under my name, Ace Antonio Hall. I have like ten thousand different Facebooks, but. Uh, you know, I think right now it's the one that has the cover for my book, Lipstick Asylum. That one's the most current one. Uh, so that's Facebook for people my age, uh, which is 40 and up. Um, and for the younger group, I do have TikTok. I just, you know, I can't, I, you know, I, I had to, I had to take, I had to get rid of the app on my phone because I get on TikTok and I'm like, oh my God, hours pass. I'm looking and laughing at all the video. <laughs> it's just, I can't do it. Um, but uh, I also have Instagram. So I love Instagram. I'm on Instagram every day. And uh, so, you know, uh, you, you can find me on Instagram. Again, it's under my name, Ace Antonio Hall, and in parentheses, N-Z-O-N-D-I. N as in Nancy, Z-O-N as in Nancy, D-I, N-Z-O-N-D-I. And on Twitter, I'm on Twitter uh, quite often. And a lot of my writer friends are on Twitter and all kinds of friends so on Twitter yeah. and uh, Twitter is uh, at Nzondi3 the number 3 at N-Z-O-N-D-I and the number 3 so you can find me in any one of those follow me follow me I have some really cool you know uh, really cool giveaways for people who follow me on Instagram so mm -hmm. check it out yeah, well, we'll make sure we, we, we have a connection on that on the website both that um, Hey, so during this last couple of years with all the crazy stuff, you know, pandemic and, yeah. uh, you know, up and down and, and people, you know, it's just, uh, it's been a lot of um, stress, a lot of turmoil, a yeah. lot of fighting, a lot of anger, um, mm -hmm. you know, all sorts of things going on, you know, conspiracies, like you, you just got it all. Like we just, yeah. um, I wonder um, how it affects you and if it does, does that get into your writing or does it, does it, does it, you know, cause I find some people say that they have a terrible time writing. They can't be creative. Other ones saying they write and they, they're more creative because they want to escape what's going on. I hear all sorts of things. What's your reaction to the, to the last couple of years? I tell you that I thought that the pandemic was going to be wonderful for my writing. I was going to write 10 books and, uh, it just has not happened that way. Uh, with more time, you waste more time, I feel like. And so um, although I'm, I try to stay disciplined and, I, you know, I wake up four or five in the morning and write, uh, there are also times uh, that everyone has been touched, I believe, during this, the last year and a half uh, of this pandemic uh, of, of finding sorrow and loss. And so I've definitely had my share of that, and that affected my writing. In different ways, you know, I try to take the sorrow, the pain, and convert it into uh, something that could be therapeutic through my writing. And so I've done a little bit of that, but it also it makes you not want to write, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I needed a, 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 I needed an escape, and part of that escape was I think I've watched more television than I ever have <laughs> in the past year and a half. You know, I used to laugh at people that binge watch. I'm like, how are you sitting there watching four or five hours of a TV show when you can be doing something productive? And I'll sit my behind there and, you know, I've watched like seven, seven, a whole thing. If that, you know, like some of the BBC shows are like six or seven episodes, I'll watch the whole thing. 
you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I found myself doing that a lot during this pandemic. Um, and then having to kind of like taper down and say, you got to get back to your writing, you know, cause I used to write when I sat down to write and, you know, I'd write, you know, six hours, you know, straight. And I haven't done that. I've done that maybe twice this whole pandemic. So I do like two hours here, two hours there. So it's definitely affected my writing, um, in many different ways. And it's also influenced my writing. I've tried to stay away from, at first I thought about infusing, a pandemic like atmosphere in some of my books, you know, what's going on now. And it just didn't work. So I, I, I've stayed away, I've frayed away from that. I wonder if you'll look back in, in five years at what you're, you've been writing during this time and think and see some of the things um, in your writing when, when we're past all this. Uh, I definitely will because one of my, uh, something that directly affected me, uh, you know, this past year. Um, so my my brother was one of the first to one of the first people to have COVID uh, right in March, mm. and uh, and he went to the hospital three times, and they turned him away, saying he didn't qualify. You know, he didn't have the whatever they used to say back then in March, uh, satisfy the conditions or, or, or have the symptoms. And so he went back three times, and then uh, within a five-day period, he passed away that fifth day. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry to hear that. You know, thank you. And, uh, you know, so he was there to drop my mother off, and, uh, and then my mother passed away from uh, respiratory about a, two months after that. And then my, one of my closest aunts, when my mother passed away, said she was ready to go. And I said, no, 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 You come on, you know. And she was having health problems. And one month after my mom's funeral, my favorite aunt, you know, who took me to my first football game, you know, she passed away only three days after getting COVID. So that was within a two, three-month period, you know, uh, three favorite people in, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then two of my sisters got it, and but they recovered. So the the whole the whole thing with my mom, you know, I was lucky enough the hospital after my brother same hospital when my brother passed in, they let me see my mother after getting a lot of different permission. And that experience is like, you know, it it, it tears my heart just seeing her, you know, uh there and, and no one else could visit her and during that whole time. That has gotten into my book. Part of that experience, so I creatively put it into my book. So I definitely will be able to look back five years from now and see part of what I experienced, that pain. I wanted to capture that pain because, you know, I feel like if you can cap, I feel like everyone in this world can relate to pain. <laughs> I don't yeah. care what age you are. You know, you're going to, I don't care if you're the queen, Michael Jack, I don't care who you are, you know, Elvis, I don't care who you are. You're going to somehow a parent <laughs> having teenage kids, you're going to somehow experience pain. And so uh, my goal is to, to, to tap into pain as much as possible and put my characters through as much as pain as possible, the kind of pain that the readers can relate to. You know, mm. not, 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 not to have dark, sad books, but, you know, to have moments of, of time in the, in, in the adventures and the upbeat, you know, part, to have those moments uh, where people can relate to. So, yeah, I'll look back and I'll see that, how the pandemic affected my writing. Absolutely. So Elvis is still alive? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know? No, nobody tells me these things, you know? I'm just like, yeah, I got to tell you, you know. Wow. You know, I, um, had a buddy, I had a buddy that told me years ago, since you, you, you mentioned conspiracy theories, I had a buddy that told me years ago, he's a musician, he's an artist, and he told me years ago that, uh, God, I can't say that guy's name. Let me think. Okay, he told me years ago that this particular artist, that Tupac asked this particular very famous artist, how could he disappear without anyone finding him? Right. And uh, and there was some other circumstance circumstances around, you know, what Tupac asked this artist that makes me believe even to this day that Tupac is alive. 
So you never know. Elvis might be a, in. You know. <laughs> well, yeah, you never know. Tupac, you know, I, I, you know, I'll give Madonna a call and see because she used to date him. <laughs> <laughs> that was the good old days. But that was, you know, that was a lot of fun back then. Um, <laughs> I still get my roses. So <laughs> I, I was going to say. Um, it's certainly been a good good conversation. We've certainly enjoyed having you on, and uh, you have a lot of good things to say. So um, Appreciate it. it's amazing. You know, we'll share everything, of course, on our website and stuff like that. And we've learned a lot today. I, I can't believe how much we learned. But cer- certainly, if you're in a supermarket and you see Ace, uh, cover up anything that you got that's light light color. Open your skirts. <laughs> yeah, because he's just gonna write all over you. Don't, just, don't do that, you know. And and um, yeah, just don't stay. Just be aware. That's so, all. David, do we go by Rose, Marty? You know. Well, we're DC trying to figure is. it out. <laughs> I know. I answered anything. <laughs> I'm trying, you know, trying to figure it out. Um, trying to figure it out. Names have power, so you, you know, because it out. sounds like a serial killer when you use his real whole name. <laughs> D- DNM. DNM. Yeah. DNM. I go by that too. Yeah. yeah. I like yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. See, you're you're getting good. Um, well, and so now, and, and before we go, there's got to be. What's the what's what's what do you, what's your biggest secret? <laughs> Well, my biggest secret. You mean besides the Madonna thing? Then no one knows what we're talking about. <laughs> no, but that's we'll keep that secret. But you got to have a secret, like a uh, uh, favorite food, favorite color. What is it that people that read your book and fans would be surprised to learn? How's that? So, this was the first year too. This Ju- July Fourth is my birthday. And, every, you know, I'm health guy, health guy. People know that I love peach cobbler, you know, but I really only eat peach cobbler like one, probably two times a year, somewhere around Thanksgiving. And then nine months out the year, I'm trying to stay sugar free. You know, I won't even have mix with sugar in it, you know. Yeah. And every 4th of July, except for this year, every single 4th of July, I go to this place called uh, Johnny Rebs, Johnny Rebs um, in California, and I order $40 worth of peach cobbler, big giant pan worth of peach cobbler, <laughs> and I eat it all by myself like in two or three days. <laughs> there you go. I don't so, believe it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they make it with drop biscuit. I mean, the mm. texture, I mean, fresh fresh peaches and it's just so good and then the, the texture of having that drop biscuit all of the the bread mixed in with the peach cobbler oh my god it's the best thing and i i've been to maybe 20 different restaurants 20 i mean i've tasted 20 i've been to 20 different places that that did peach cobbler in california and this place johnny ribs is the best plus their ribs fall off the bone i'm just saying so I don't think people know I'm that I now. that much. Yeah. Stuff. yeah, like you don't need anything to eat. You've had enough. <laughs> yeah, well, you're trying to lose you the gut. Not you yeah, can't eat rib and peach cobbler. Jeez. Well, our guest Ace Antonio Hall. Thank you for being here. Hey, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, uh, uh, <laughs> Rosie. Whatever my name is. Oh, yeah, party. <laughs> DNL. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, Thanks, yeah. <laughs> To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.